Also just want to contextualize this for all the students in the room. Whether you're going to serve in the Department of Defense or some dimension of security or maybe law enforcement or some civilian sector, this is not something that's outside of what you're going to be doing. It's critically important that you understand the, the nexus and the intersection between artificial intelligence and robotics. And by the way, if you have a cell phone, you're being influenced by this right now. And the majority of you, I hope you understand that, but maybe some of you don't. But this is not something that should not be of interest to you, and this is why we're having this conversation here at Norwich University, is that we pick subjects that matter to 21st century security challenges, and this is one of the most pressing. The things that uh, you'll hear over the next couple of days, some of us are trying to imagine what that looks like, but you're going to be leading through this. You're going to be the ones that has to make the decisions. You're going to be the ones that's going to have to fight on different multiple dimensions of a battlefield. So some of the things that are of discussion over the next couple of days, it's going to be your reality. And this is why we're here, because we want you to excel and we want you to exceed. Now, Artificial intelligence or robotics is not just a US-centric conversation. This is something that's a global conversation. We're having this conversation right now in English, but it's being held in Arabic, it's being held in Hebrew, in German, in Chinese, in Korean. Governments and Department of Defense organizations around the globe are having similar conversations. And this is why we are having this at Norwich. Whether you're computer science, background or not, criminal justice, biology, or chemistry, this subject matters to you. So in spirit of that, we've asked some students uh, to come and share some of their reflections, and we've asked some of them to, to read some of the things that they've written in their native language. And so I've asked uh, Rodian, why don't you come out front? He's gonna share something that he wrote, and we've asked students to also share what they wrote in their, their, their native tongue. So if you would, uh, just permit Rodian to share, and then we're going to turn it over to our moderator and our very distinguished guest, August Cole. So Rodian, the floor is yours. Війна і люди. Я вважаю, що всі ви вже чули про Україну та її хоробрих українців, які зараз борються за свою свободу та свою батьківщину. Україна – це і моя батьківщина. Завдяки великій допомозі важливих міжнародних партнерів, і одним з яких є Сполучені Штати Америки, Україна отримає більш сучасну зброю щотижня чи місяця. Ракетні системи, як «Хаймарс», безпілотник і дальний дій, як «Свічблейд», гаубиці та системи «ППО». Усі ці інноваційні засоби бою суттєво захищають українську землю від російських окупантів та контракують ходи ворога. Проте є ще одна важлива річ, яку слід сказати. Весь, весь цей процес відсічі, який ви бачите на військових мапах, був би неможливий без ключового фактора – людей. Ми, українці, мотивовані, бо знаємо, за що ми боремося – за рідних, за дім, за наш шлях життя. Ми краще помремо, ніж будемо знову під російською окупацією, як за часів Радянського Союзу та імперістичної Росії. Якщо говорити про мотивацію, де ще можна знайти звичайних працьовитих людей, які лише за кілька днів можуть зібрати більше 600 мільйонів доларів на покупку військових безпілотників? Цей випадок закінчився тим, що військова технічна компанія, приголомшена вчинком українців, безкоштовно виготовила бажані військові дрони в подарунок нації. Ви запитаєте, що сталося з грошима? Українці не зупинилися. Українці не зупинилися, то купили національний супутник, який зараз допомагає збирати високоточні розвіддані з поля бою. Як відомо, активна інформаційна війна розгортається і на теренах інтернету. Якщо публічна особа твітне щось недоречне про російську агресію чи анексовані території, там будуть українці. Недавні випадки можуть довести, що їх буде так багато в розділі коментарів, що люди будуть гадати, що це спрямована атака бота. Але це було б неправильним припущенням. 
Усі ці коментарі – це розлючні українці, які висловлюють свої думки та оцінки ситуації. Звичайно, люди в Україні різні, і кожен має свій розум. Але перед обличчям зла чи нечесності вони мобілізуються і об'єднуються, щоб боротися разом. Я вважаю, що це також спонукає інші країни допомагати нам і надавати ще більше підтримки, що я вкрай вважаю у темні часи. Звичайно, можна сказати, що війни виграють роботи та дрони. Але правда полягає в тому, що справжні історії завжди стосуються людей, які стоять за цими технологіями. Це про солдатів, операторів, волонтерів, які присвячують своє життя допомозі нежденним, людей, які щоденно працюють для стабільної економіки, і людей, які борються за український прапор. Вони гинуть за цей прапор, і тим не менш вони борються за дім, щоб розірвати цикл російського колоніалізму на нашій землі і захистити нашу право як нації раз і назавжди. Коли у людей є причина жити і захищати свою батьківщину, вони об'єднуються і всі разом створюють приголомшливі результати, які можуть здивувати навіть найбільш скептично налаштованих людей на інших континентах. Головний фактор досягнення та перемоги продиктований нашою людською натурою та мотивацією, яка запалює світло в інших. Країна, які люди давали ще три доби до капітуляції, тепер ще 230 днів. Це не казка. Це, пані та панове, Україна та її люди. War and people. War and people. I believe that all of you have already heard about Ukraine and brave Ukrainians who are fighting on their freedom and their homeland right now. Ukraine is my homeland too. With the great help of critical international partners, one of which is the United States, Ukraine gets more modern weaponry every week to months. Rocket systems like HIMARS, long distance drones like Switchblade, howitzers and air defense systems. All these innovative means of combat significantly protect Ukrainians' land from Russian occupants and counterattack the enemy moves. Yet there's another vital thing to say. All this fight back progress you can see on the military maps wouldn't be possible without a key component, people. We Ukrainians are motivated because we are know what we're fighting for. Our closest one, the home and the way of life. We'd rather die than be under Russian occupation just like during the Soviet Union and Imperial Russia. Talking about motivation, where can you find ordinary, hardworking people fundraising over $600 million in just a span of a few days? This case has <coughs> resulted in a military tech company overwhelmed by Ukrainians' deed, producing desired military drones for free as a gift to nation. You would ask what happened to the money? Ukraine then stopped and purchased a national satellite that helps to collect high-resolution intelligence from the battlefield. As you know, active information warfare also unfolds on terrains of the Internet. If a public figure tweets something inappropriate about Russian aggression or the annexed territories, Rus uh, Ukrainians will be there. Recent cases can prove that there would be so many of them in the comment section that people can assume it was directed bot attack. But it would be a wrong assumption. All the comments are just angry Ukrainians giving their opinions and evaluating the situation. Sure, the people of Ukraine are very different and each has their own mind. But in the face of evil and dishonesty, they mobilize and reunite to fight together. I believe this also motivates other nations to help us and to provide even more support, which is crucial during dark times. Of course, one can say that Wars are, won wars are won by robots and drones, but the truth is that the actual story is always about the people behind those technologies. It is about the soldiers and operators, the volunteers who dedicate their life to help those in need, people working day to day for a stable economy, and people who fight for this flag. This flag is signed by those who are on the front lines. Some of them might not be alive, yet they die fighting for home, to break the cycle of Russian colonialism on our land, and to protect our future as a nation once and for all. Those people create victories and write history.
When people have a reason to live and to protect their homeland, they unite and all together create astonishing results that can surprise even the most skeptical people on other continents. The main factor to achieve and win anything is dictated by human nature of us and the motivations that ignite others. A country that people gave three days before capitulation is now staying 230 days. This is not a fairy tale. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Ukraine and its people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Liptak, who's going to serve as our moderator for today's session. So students, please, if you have questions, he's going to open it up for questions later on. So have your questions prepared and, and ready to go. So Andrew, over to you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Seeing some nods. Okay, good. Welcome to, uh, we're going to be talking about science fiction, artificial intelligence, and the future of warfare. Uh, my name is Andrew Liptak. I am a graduate of Norwich University. Uh, I graduated in 2007 and again in 2009 with my master's in military history. Um, and I've worked as a journalist, uh, historian, and uh, science fiction writer, uh, particularly focusing on the future of uh, warfare and military science fiction. So that's why I'm here today. And that's how I came to know um, our speaker, August Cole, who is an, ex an author who has explored the future of conflict through fiction uh, and other forms of what he calls uh, ficint, uh, fictional intelligence as a form of storytelling. <clears throat> His talks, short stories, workshops, and more have taken him from speaking at the Nobel Institute in Oslo to presenting, the, uh, uh, to presenting on the future of warfare at the South by Southwest Interactive uh, Festival to lecturing at West Point. And uh, with Peter W. Singer, he is the co-author of the bestseller Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war, uh, which was published in 2015. And uh, Burn In, um, a novel of the real robotic revolution, which is this book right here. Um, I highly recommend both of them. They're excellent reads. Um, and he's also um, written a number of short stories and um, presentations um, through a project that he and Singer have called Useful Fiction. Um, so I guess what we wanted to talk about today is just the idea that the warfare is advancing in a, a, a many, many different ways. And uh, in, some, in some cases, it's been influenced by science fiction. It's been imag certainly imagined by science fiction authors and creators over the years. And I just sort of wanted to go back a little bit to the earlier days of science fiction to sort of imagine how, or talk a little bit about how warfare was or science fiction authors imagined warfare. So w when was your introduction to science fiction and, and when you sort of realized that, you know, th these were authors imagining what the future warfare might look like? So uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to connect uh, back here again in Norwich for a second time. Uh, the, the history of my kind of love for science fiction goes back to more or less you know, when I started to, to uh, the Cold War era that I grew up in was heavily influencing science fiction at the time, not just, of course, books, but also films. I, you know, my parents took me to see Terminator uh, uh, 1986, I think it was, right before, in the theater, which is a little bit unusual, I suppose, but that, I think, speaks to the enthusiasm I had for that kind of a subject. And that's actually a film that may seem anachronistic today, but it's had a long kind of a shadow, if you will, over the thinking about robotics, about machine uprising, about science fiction. You know, that was one form. The other, you know, novels and such that I read that really kind of integrated this sort of ideal uh, of a robot as a soldier, but in a more kind of complex way. You had David Drake, for example, 1980s you know, kind of payday science fiction, military sci-fi writer. Uh, but what, what really got my attention, though, and I think came, came kind of a, a source of inspiration was the sci-fi writer William Gibson. Uh, his, you know, work more or less helped establish how we visualize like what the internet is, cyberspace, it's called back in the day. And uh, you know, some of his most recent writing delves into this question of the future of robotics, not in the kind of conventional Terminator sense, but the notion of telepresence can you relate to, to one another through, for example, uh, robotic systems. Show the Peripheral, which is a version of his novel uh, about four years ago, it's coming out now, for example, on, I think it's on Amazon Prime. So, so I, you know, from, from that kind of arc of, of both books from Gibson uh, to James Cameron film Terminator, I think I kind of I'm always constantly kind of searching for a North Star, trying to understand the problem. 
One of the interesting things I've always found just delving into the history of science fiction is how much the image of a robot has changed over time. Uh, if you go all the way back to the 1920s, the, the pulp era of sci-fi, you have authors sort of imagining these like mindless um, automatons just raging and, and, and you know, killing and, and there's all these different uh, depictions. You go forward a little bit, you, you jump over to Isaac Asimov who wrote stories um, uh, for books like I, Robot or, and later Caves of Steel and, and Foundation where he, or Foundation a little bit later, but he sort of imagined them as, as being useful components of society or, or tools that people would use that weren't necessarily threatening. Um, and then you advance a little bit more further down the line and you have um, you know, William Gibson, Neuromancer sort of imagining artificial intelligence being a slightly more menacing, nebulous thing rather than a, a, something that is in the body of a robot. Um, and it's been interesting to see just sort of how those technological changes have progressed as time goes on and, and how they are influenced by the, the technology of the day. Um, certainly when Asimov was writing about his first robot stories, uh, computers were the, you know, didn't really exist. And, and by the time that they started to exist, they were the size of you know, rooms in you know, the 1950s and 60s. So that was certainly a leap forward. So what science fiction are you seeing today, uh, minus, not including your book, that you are you know, seeing, that is in, or seeing that it is being influenced by the, the, the uh, state of robotics today? Or you can include your book, I guess, if you'd like. No, I mean, in many ways, you know, Burnin was, was kind of a pushback against the, uh, you know, Skynet annihilation of humanity model. But the thing that kept and keeps me and my co-writer Peter Singer up at night is, is less the, ro uh, the robot uprising and the, again, the Terminator concept, but more what are we going to do to one another with, with robotics? Like, we, we pose enough of a threat uh, that I worry about that more than a generalized intelligence. The, the, the point you made, too, about the, the kind of interwar year, uh, is really important for understanding robotics because we, we, in many ways right now, might be in that kind of interwar period. And, you know, one of the really foundational you know, creative products, uh, pieces of content, is this uh, Czech play called uh, Ruhr, uh, R-U-R, the acronym. And it's about a robot uprising in a factory, essentially androids, where they, they, the machines rise up and wipe out humanity. In, in uh, this a couple of uh, Sipak's story, which is Rossum's Universal Robots, he introduced this notion of robot, robot, and so you know we're at a, we're at a, a kind of centennial point for that, right? For that book, your past exactly a centennial. Yeah. Right, so so it's a reminder of kind of how new much of this is, but yet we've been wrestling with these same questions for so long, and we haven't quite answered them. So that makes me often think: Are we asking the right ones? You know, the the, the the really interesting and intriguing aspect of the future of robotics is actually more to me less about the anthropomorphization, right? Less about the thing with two legs or the robot dog, but more actually about how the software that that underlies robotic systems, that shapes how we relate to them at an emotional level, I think is really crucial. What is the essence of trust in machines? Again, this is a theme that uh, Pete and I spent a lot of time really trying to think through. How do you know when you can trust uh, a robotic system in your life? You know, when I'm in my you know, forerunner and I have my radar cruise control, I'm trusting, right, that that system is gonna, gonna keep me at a safe distance from the car in front of me. That's a variation on a theme that we're gonna see more and more and more of in industrial applications, the medical world, as we earlier heard, but also, of course, the future of conflict. You know, the robotic wingman programs the U.S. Air Force is investing in is going to certainly put people into that position of having to trust systems with their lives, not only just in the sense of, is it safe to fly, you know, next to this bot, but also, can I count on it to defend? When, you, you know, you're, you're looking, well, what do I then go read, right? What do I watch? Uh, and, and I think, actually, the, the, the books and the films that get at this relationship with machines are the most important ones. It's almost 10 years now since uh, the film Her came out from Spike Jones. Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with his phone operating system, essentially, which is a really, really very important film for understanding the way we begin to under, we begin to really kind of know uh, ourselves through our relationships with machines. Similarly, there's a novel by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro called Clara and the Sun, uh, which came out, I think, about a year and a half ago that I would highly recommend too, because it's really about the role that a robotic like android essentially can play in a family and the notion of like what is human and what is uh, love and attention and where do we want from our machines right and how does that change society because as we consider conflict as we consider this kind of arc you know going back again to say you know 1921 to 2021 to 2022 and then 10 years out from now 10 years past that 
are we going to be in a position to keep asking the same question again, or are we going to kind of evolve that thinking? And I think the more we understand software, particularly as it relates to like more capable systems like artificial intelligence, we're, we're going to get closer to, to making decisions today that help us avoid the kind of outcomes that are, that are you know, that we want to avoid. One what, what of the things that I, I spoke at a, a, a conference similar along these lines at West Point a couple of years ago, and one of the takeaways that I had, um, and I, I still have it saved somewhere, is one of the speakers said, I'm not afraid of you know the humanoid Terminator bots. I'm afraid of the server farms, um, and not necessarily the, the things falling over on you, but like just the, the amount of information that they can process and the, the influence that they can wield as a, as a tool. Um, I, and that's, that has struck with me um, or stuck with me for, for years now. Um, I guess let, let's talk a little bit about your book because you, um, you draw on the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years of, of robotics advances and your book is very much a different take from the term. Actually, let's back up a little bit further. Um, how many of you all have seen Terminator? It's, okay, good. It's an 80s film, uh, you, you can never quite be sure if everyone's seen it. Um, that movie has really, cemented the idea of killer robots, I think, in the, in the hands of, uh, you know, in, in the minds, of, minds of, of people, whether they're in the military or, or artificial intelligence folks. And I'm guessing that over the years, you've seen a lot of people sort of have that, like, this is what the future of, of warfare is going to look like, you know, you know, skeletal robots killing people. Uh, how, how, how else have you seen that image sort of get dropped into, like, you know, it, it seems like it, it's like, a, it's something you sort of have to work around in order to talk about artificial intelligence, it, it either in you know, introducing people to the idea of an of a, of a, of a artificial intelligence that's really you know, aimed at killing all of humanity, but also you know, it's not necessarily accurate, right? You know, you've seen this in the debate around the ethics uh, using you know, robotic systems and AI type systems in warfare. Uh, <clears throat> the campaign against killer robots had a movie called Slaughterbots, uh, which came out, I don't know, four years ago or so. That you know was a very sensationalized look at like a a, a, a pretty gory like attack using you know swarms um, to target civilians, and you know it, it is clearly the kind of narrative and messaging that resonates with a lot of people as they try to understand how these technologies are going to shape conflict. And what's difficult in those kinds of contexts is that much like when we see debate in social media using extremes to capture eyeballs and attention, you often actually get further and further away from reality and fact. And you know, many of the bigger challenges, that, especially that have to do with ethics and do care in modern conflict, have continuity you know, from the era we're in now to the, the era we're going into. You know, law of armed conflict is going to evolve just as much for online activities as much as it is for you know, robots, for example. So the, the challenge then is how do you come up with like a kind of credible vision of the future that you can then start building you know, policy or rules or doctrine and tactics towards? And that's, I think, you know, to some extent, a, very, a response to this question is that you really have to work with the facts and, you know, the, the technological facts, but also understanding how people have related to, to technologies in the past, how or big organizations deal with disruption. So many of these systems, if they are actually implemented, will be incredibly disruptive. You know, one of the bigger themes in Burn-In is the economic uh, and labor market disruption that's coming from not just, you know, robotic machines that handle uh, the kinds of tasks that are kind of in the uh, everyday, you know, sense, uh, how I, my food is prepared, for example, how, my, how I receive something in the mail. But software is fundamentally changing fields like medicine, of course, as we know, AI is doing this already, the law. Uh, all of the communities in uh, American society that have thought themselves immune from disruption, that thought their, you know, jobs were safe, so to speak, uh, are just as vulnerable as people all uh, in other parts of society too. And, and that is back to this nature of like, what is conflict itself in this era that we're entering? You know, is it a van full of uh, swarming, you know, biotag robots that are gonna find you in a crowded room like this? Or is it a much more cognitively oriented campaign that you know, induces people to, you know, essentially, uh, you know, fight one another within a society so an adversary doesn't have to do that. You know, we have these kind of big meta questions about, about the nature of conflict, but riven through them all is, of course, this question of not just the, the hardware itself, but more so the software. Uh, let's, you, you talk about going, you know, 
authors sticking to facts rather than sort of sensationalism. So let's talk about your book a little bit because you you take a very different tact towards the idea of a robot. Um, so tell us a little bit about like what where did this book come from and, and a little bit about Tams, the, the robot that's sort of it's central to the plot here. Yeah, the, the way I write fiction is not necessarily how everybody else does it. We use a lot of endnotes and footnotes, and this was something we tried experimentally with Ghost Fleet, our first book, because this was about a fairly big idea uh, that was, you know, really we thought going to be potentially like laughed at, you know, China essentially going to war with the U.S. by taking Hawaii. Uh, so we said, all right, you know, let's, let's like use the same sort of nonfiction research that uh, myself and my co-writer had done in our careers and, and apply that to fiction. And so every time there was a technological capability, you know, uh, a robot, for example, that we were imagining China using in occupied Hawaii or uh, some piece of like PLA doctrine, like we footnoted that uh, cyber vulnerability in the U.S. supply chain that you know, was tactically relevant, footnoted it. When we took on Burn In, this is a different kind of book because this is a counterterrorism story. And it's really about the nature of, of, of uh, American society you know, in the AI era. And the FBI agent, Laura Keegan, who's partnered with this robot, which is a biped, kind of a conventional uh, you know, looking robot in some ways, but we tried to then think, well, how do we make this not like another Terminator story, right? So the, the, the like nonfiction research that we did, we talked to roboticists, we talked to ethicists, we worked on really trying to understand not how we might imagine a robot partner might work for a federal law enforcement you know, agent, but actually like how it would work uh, in the mechanical sense, things like charging, things like mobility. And, and then of course, you know, we relate to these kinds of systems, you know, at a certain point you begin to develop that, that trust or emotional attachment. And that was a really important and you know, really challenging part of this book in terms of the character arc, right? Because you want your characters to start and end as different people, right? They need to become more interesting, overcome bigger challenges. So how do you do that with a machine? Well, and then not only that, thinking about how the human relates to the machine. And so we, we really tried to bake that in. And one of the ways we played with that, which is the thing reflecting of the way that many of you are going to start experiencing, you know, these kinds of technologies is, the capability that gets added and added and added with access to more and more data, right? Again, if software is driving the importance and relevance of a robotic system, it's not the thing itself, you know, what data it has access to, how it's able to process that is going to be incredibly important in changing the nature of your relationship with it. Now, TAMS itself, we, we actually made in the book a pretty small robot, you know, kind of diminutive, almost childlike. And that was a very deliberate choice too, to kind of push back against this sort of Terminator, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, paradigm was, you know, let's really think about how you might want a robot to, to operate in the real world. And in the research conversations we had, you know, you'd want it to be small so it could fit in the trunk, you know, when you weren't using it or it could crawl into spaces that a human couldn't necessarily go. It should have limbs that are articulated in ways that, you know, would function like our skeletal systems do. Uh, a torso that can spin around, you know, a full articulation on a shoulder, for example. And also the way that we sense and perceive, you know, with our five senses, those would be, would be you, know, you know, kind of analogous sense present in this robot, but there would be other capabilities, right? To be able to see behind you, to be able to look into the Wi-Fi spectrum and sense what's around you, see through walls in that way. And so that, that to us began to kind of really answer the question in a very practical sense of, you know, what is a robot actually going to do for us, right? Versus, versus what we think it might be. One of the things I'm always frustrated by with science fiction is when you can the author is basically, or creator has decided to use a robot as sort of like just a stand-in for just a, a combatant. <clears throat> and they miss their shots, they don't see things. And it's always interesting just to see, to imagine like just how much we imagine robots or robotic systems as, or, or give them abilities that are human-like. And those, you know, there's a lot of limitations. Like you just said, like we can't see behind us, we can't see, into the Wi-Fi spectrum, so I'm I'm curious to see like how what about what what level have do we balance sort of the idea of making them appealing so that they're not creepy or yeah if, if everyone's seen seen the robot dogs and sort of feels sort of unsettled by them versus something that is fully functional um, you know on the battlefield or or operating in with alongside people with with Tams the uh, which is an acronym for tactical autonomous mobility system. We spent a lot of time, by the way, thinking of like the right acronym for this, this robot. <laughs> Originally it was called August of all things. Um, the, uh, not a robot. You know, one of the tests we, we wanted to kind of apply was like, like the, the kind of kindergartner test, right? Like would a, would a child be comfortable holding its hand without being fearful, right? And so that's a really interesting design question. 
uh, because you know these sorts of systems, and this is true in the military sense, you know, have to exist in a civilian context as much as they do, you know, in a pure military application. You know, it's really easy to lose sight of that, you know, in a very kind of narrow view. But if you do step back and think, you know, about what is the problem I'm trying to solve with this system, which is very much kind of the challenge that we undertake when we do these fiction projects. What is the thing I'm trying to address? Uh, you, you know, you get, I think, closer to, to the actual reality. Similarly, you know, the way we perceive, uh, you know, military robotics, uh, understanding how challenging some of the engineering thresholds are around, you know, size, weight, power, heat, et cetera, uh, you know, may mean that we are going to be in an era where robotics are more and more disposable and they're actually quite small uh, for the reason that, you know, bigger things present easier targets. Uh, we are going to, we're already in an era where if you can see something, you can destroy it. So thinking about the hiding, seeking aspects of the modern battlefield. And then as well too, you know, these are systems that are going to have to be acquired, right? There's a bureaucracy behind that. And that defense industrial, that acquisition side, which is probably really hard to write a novel about. Although Liu Shishin, a Chinese science, fighter, science fiction writer, wrote Ball Lightning, which is actually about defense acquisitions in China. It's, very, it's a very good novel in this regard about a super weapon, not a robot per se. But the point is, you know, you have to also understand the context of, you know, from where these things come, right? And, you know, being able to kind of crack that really almost boring part of it is actually, I think, as a sci-fi writer, as, you know, a military professional in your case, as students and, and now, uh, is going to be really crucial because all these things exist in an ecosystem. And it's quite easy, again, in the cinematic sense or the video game sense, or even, you know, science fiction isn't really rooted in this kind of usefulness, uh, can can just kind of elide over that. And I think that that isn't actually, you know, often as helpful as, as we need it to be because we really do need new ways to think about this. And it is okay to play video games to think about the future of comic. It is okay to read graphic novels, to write them for that matter. I would encourage you to be doing those sorts of things. Yeah, Terminator can be good homework. Uh, well, sort of good homework. What, one of the things that I, I've, I've been endlessly fascinated by is, especially because y'all are, are going to be, presumably, or at least a, a good portion of you are going to be going into the military at some point, and there's a very good chance that you will be operating alongside some sort of robotic system, whether it is a drone or um, I don't, one of the Boston, maybe not one of the Boston Endemics dogs, but like a, 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 a knockoff or a similar version. Um, there was a, a really interesting story that I read a, about a year ago. Um, it was published in, in Slate magazine, part of their Future Tense series. Um, this is a, a, writer, a series where they, they partner with the Arizona State University and they are writing uh, sort of like uh, science fiction about something that's extremely relevant. And um, this, this story was by uh, an author named Justina Ireland called Collateral Damage. And it, it is about a squad of soldiers who are basically given a robotic system and they're testing it out because the, the military has, has begun to you know, vet whether or not these are worth acquiring or not. And it just does not go well, uh, not because the robot has, has malfunctioned or anything. It, it actually performs perfectly, but the soldiers are alongside it just do not trust it. They think that it's watching them and it's, it's getting ready to, like, you know, it's, it's reporting on their every move. And they end, uh, spoiler alert, they end up basically destroying it. Um, and... One of the things that I've, I've found endlessly fascinating is that there is a level of trust that is needed in order to operate alongside these robots. And it's not really something that science fiction has ever really talked about. Usually, our AI is, a, is, this an, is an antagonist. It, it is something that you are fighting against. Um, your book, and I think there's a couple of other stories where you were actively trying to work alongside robots. Um, but like, what do you use? This seems like a, a really good source of human drama. Um, you know, how do you how do you see these types of stories, um, you know, existing uh, in, in coming or coming into existence in the future? Or have you read any others that are like uh, that are along those lines? Yeah, this, this is a great tension. And, you know, these kinds of, uh, you know, contradictions or inherent tensions make for great narrative. Right. And, uh, you know, in burn in, you know, one of the challenges is not only do I trust this machine to save my life or to help me with this investigation, but am I training it to become so good that it takes my job? That's also a really interesting factor in the defense realm, too. Uh, you know, when you're trying to consider, too, the trade space that anybody has in their 24 hours in a day, you know, many of these systems are not intuitive. Many of these systems are incredibly complicated. They break a lot. How do, you know, commanders, if you're a company commander or even a platoon commander, how do you assign and assess the amount of time, for example, that you should be allocating? To learning a new system versus working on marksmanship or fitness or just recovery or, or, or whatever else. 
this is like an ongoing tension at this moment right now, right, with uh, some of the small robots that are being used in urban operations, for example. There is a lot of skepticism to your point. And, you know, many of the practices that we've seen with uh, increasingly intelligent software from the civilian world, from the work world, particularly during COVID, about persistent surveillance of remote workers, et cetera, are, are really going to be problematic on the battlefield. They're going to be really problematic for military culture. And so I think it's actually incumbent to start thinking about those things now, as that short story collateral damage did. Where are our left and right limits? What are our guardrails where we don't want? You know, what are the, is the essence of the, of the experience uh, of, of service, or what do we need to complete the mission, and how do we keep the machine from, from you know, not getting in the way of that? I don't mean in the literal sense, like you know, it ran out of batteries and it wasn't useful, but how does it change our command culture? How does it, how does it you know, affect the human dimension, as we just heard, right? You know, we can write novels and make movies and, and, and video games that are you know, grand in scope, but if we really focus too much on the technology, not understand enough and spend enough care exploring that human experience with it, then we're not, we're not really doing anything you know, that's, that's going to be of much help trying to figure out some of these hardest questions. Yeah, and, and science fiction can do a lot more than just inspire readers. I mean, it, it, is, it is a good way to sort of, I've always mentioned, sort of prototyping the future where you are, it, it, it costs millions of dollars to actually make a robot and, and field test it and everything, but it doesn't, it costs, you know, a couple hundred bucks to hire a writer to write a story that will sort of work out some of the implications. Um, you know, what do, what do writers need to be doing today if they want to write, con, you know, convincingly about robotics and not going sort of down the Terminator route of, like, you know, evil, auto, you know, if it becomes sentient and decides humanity is worth destroying. Because um, we've seen that story and movie many times. But, like, so, like, how do you, how do you tell something that's relevant? And, and what do you need to draw on to make sure that, you know, you're not just sort of going down old tropes? Yeah, trying to be original in you know writing about robotics is really challenging, and and it's I think therefore one that's really interesting to take on. You know the 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 challenge for a writer today who's who's you know literally let's say writing science fiction or fiction you know about the future is that we're living in the middle of a moment where science fiction feels like everyday technology, right? So I think you actually have to embrace that. One of the the ways though that that I like to approach some of some of these sorts of tech trends, whether it's again you know, radicalization through social media, whether it's this kind of employment question with you know, everyday robotics and AI, it is to kind of like crank the dial up to like 11, right? Um, I think that is a, a really, really effective way to kind of take something to an extreme and then see what does that vision look like? And does that feel credible or not? Secondly, you know, I do think there's a fundamental level of just kind of, and I'm a, you know, history major, right? I'm not an engineer, but doing a fundamental level of research to be familiar enough. Uh, and then if you're not able to kind of get a grasp on something to find somebody who is and to be able to reach out to them. One, one of the things we, we constantly rely on in, in our books, in our short fiction, Peter and I, is, is close readers, you know, people who we trust who can give us essentially a thumbs up or thumbs down whether something passes the professional like giggle test. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll write something that doesn't. We have to go back and start over again. Uh, and that's what we want to have happen when we're designing, still building the story, even after having written it. You know, similarly, I think, too, you know, when you're trying to, you know, think about the things in your life where you're, what are your pain points, right? What are the things that are hardest for you emotionally, physically, et cetera? And then try to understand where does technology alleviate that or how does it make it worse, right? You know, think about some of those everyday aspects of your life, the persistence of your phone. And sometimes when you wonder, is it listening to me or not, right? Again, to the point of the collateral damage story or others like that. What if you took that and turned that up to 11 and it was? Uh, what if, you know, you took some of the paradigms about uh, things like valor, and looked at like past military records of service and began to look at those historical examples, because I do believe history is one of the best you know, tools that a sci-fi writer, a fictional writer has, and began to interject robotics and, and things like that in, in there. So you can really ask these bigger questions of, you know, in the nature, uh, in the era of a, uh, you know, uh, an infantry formation that is, you know, let's say more than half a sheet. What is valor, right? What if the most charismatic person in your unit is like an AI, you know, to use the Spike Jones for a film? I did a project like that for the British Army. Uh, it was turned into a short, I wrote as a short story to explore that question. And I thought it was really important to begin to understand because that's a question that if you don't wrestle with today, you're going to get caught, you know, out by that sooner than you think. Uh, last question, we'll turn it over to, to you folks to ask your own. Um, what, 
books or stories have you read recently that are well worth um, you know these folks reading when it comes to, when it comes to robotics and, and AI? Yeah, I, I would I would recommend Clara and the Sun, uh, like I mentioned earlier, by Kazuo Ichiguro. It's again, it's not a military story, but it's very much important to understand the kind of human dimension of what it's like to live with machines and software in your in your day to day life. Similarly, uh, you know, if my antidote to the kind of Terminator is, you know, this I keep saying software, software. Uh, earlier, there was a book that was put on the screen, The Chaos Machine, by Max Fisher, about kind of how algorithmic driven. Uh, you know, companies like Facebook, like Google, you know, YouTube particularly, are shaping our kind of cognitive uh, realm. I think that's actually incredibly important because that same design impulse, that same, you know, engineering pipeline that's, you know, reforming radically our civilian world is gonna do the same thing to military robotics. And many of those things we must not see repeated, you know, in the realms of future, of kind of future forces uh, that are using these systems. All right, uh, who's got questions? Come on up. Uh, hello, um, my name is uh, Gabriel Williams. I'm a senior here at Political Science, and um, I really enjoyed your talk. And I had a question, really. So you talk about this dynamic moving forward where human-machine teaming is going to be Speak up just a little bit. Uh, you talk about moving forward, this dynamic where human-machine teaming is going to be really important in the military and defense industries and also in the civilian sector as well. Uh, and you touched on the skepticism component, right? And my question is really, you know, kind of on the defense side, but also from a holistic perspective, you know, how do we codify, you know, the planning process of integrating, you know, some of these AI components, these cognitive systems into these teaming environments? And how do we overcome that gap of skepticism by, you know, projecting this persona of having AI that's governable, that's responsible, that's ethical? How do we, how do we bridge that gap between the humans and the machine to, to create that human machine teaming environment? Uh, that's an awesome question. Uh, and I, yeah, I think, you know, fundamentally, being able to experiment as much as possible in an applied sense, whether it's National Training Center, whether it's taking things into operational deployments, uh, is essential. But within that, though, you have to wrestle with failure, right? How do you, as uh, a military institution, how does Congress particularly, address these kinds of phases like the one we're in? where you know, we live in a zero defect world, right, in, in the political sense. Uh, and so being able to create space to make mistakes that aren't catastrophic for careers, for programs, for budgets, I think is essential. Because through those failures, you begin to understand what works and what doesn't in a, in a believable and credible way. At the same time, I do think a level of skepticism is always healthy. It's inherent to our system, I think, and, 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 and can be really, I think, smartly applied. But, but fundamentally, it's, it's a culture question about how we're allowing people to, to experiment with these systems. Can you imagine, for example, and I've joked about this before in the marine context, but imagine at Norwich, you know, on arriving, you're given uh, a, a, you know, a, a terrestrial drone or a small, like, you know, palm copter type thing. And your job for, like, your first year, you know, is to modify it, is to fight with other students with theirs, you know, and so that you're understanding and living with that robotics in almost that Tamagotchi kind of sense. I think that's actually kind of a profound cultural step that would be really interesting to see because you begin to have the kind of hands-on practice that lets you understand uh, what these technologies can actually do and what they can't want to support. And bridging the gap, there's, there's two things that come to mind for me. Is the first one is, you know, seeing, having, or living alongside these sort of technological systems in your everyday life. Look at, uh, you know, there's a big experiment going on right now with Tesla. I mean, you, are ha you have the cars driving all over the place learning as they go to help better their um, self-driving ambitions. So the more people who drive those cars begin to understand you know, intimately what those systems are able to do and what their capabilities are because they are using them every single day, um, whether it's, it's you know, being able to take their hands off the wheel for a couple minutes or hopefully not you know, falling asleep and not crashing it. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is, is the you know, people, uh, you know, canine units. Like you, you are working alongside a, another system and you are learn, you know, every day you are training with it and you're working alongside it and you begin to very from, become very familiar with how you know, the, the animal works and what they are capable of doing. So. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I think we've got time for just a couple more, so we'll try to run through them quickly. Yeah, hi, I'm Lyle Goldstein. I'm with uh, Defense Priorities. 
in Washington and, and also at work at Brown University. But uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to listen to uh, August Cole here. I'm a huge fan of Ghost Fleet, and I would recommend to everybody in the audience to, uh, this is a must read. I focus on China, and uh, if you're interested in what a US-China war would look like, and it's, it's something hard to imagine, but that, I think, Ghost Fleet is probably the best possible uh, examination of that topic, so really um, strongly recommend it. Um, a couple of questions. You talked about, you said your new book is more kind of talks about the labor market and how disruptive this is, but of course for military organizations it's also disruptive and you were hinting at that. So I mean, I wondered if you could kind of, uh, in fact, in the latest Top Gun film, I think that's a major theme. You know, will, is there a future for manned carrier aviation? So how, how should military leaders um, cope with this inherent problem that, you know, pilots are always going to be uncomfortable with um, drone operators and may dislike them? You know, this idea that you're, the, the machines are putting a lot of whole jobs within the military at risk. Um, and this huge transformation is probably an order that will involve a lot of bureaucratic uh, tumult or chaos, or, or so could you speak to that issue? And then um, also- Let's just sit, we'll, let's do the one because we have okay, a couple sure. students. Yeah, I, I think uh, the way the Top Gun sequel kind of slyly you know, played at that point is a really apt, you know, very kind of public ex exposition on, on this, this tension. And there, there, is no, there is no, you know, alternative that, you know, that kind of autonomous and unmanned, uh, particularly in aviation, uh, is coming, uh, and especially in, I think, you know, maritime kind of naval context. You know, will you see a transition that is slow rolled, perhaps, for cultural or, or, or you know, parochial reasons? There's a good chance. Uh, the risk that you face, though, is that an adversary is not encumbered by that same, that same tradition, if you want to call it that. I think, again, similarly, uh, you know, in, in the kind of uh, round, you know, slash infantry uh, you're going to see a lot of, I think, tension around that too. Uh, this notion of how we look at like base realignment closure processes uh, is going to probably have another wave in the 20, late 2020s, early 2030s, as we begin to kind of wrestle with this question of, again, the economy is changing, you have to still pay for entitlements. How big of a force can, 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 can you support? And, you know, there's a good chance that that, that trade space is going to come from you know, essentially a smaller formation, a smaller end strength uh, to, to, the, to the favor of robotics. But whether, whether we're ready for that reality, I, 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 don't, I don't see a real desire and appetite for that because it's so politically and culturally challenging. But that doesn't mean that's not what the future is, right? In fact, that's often an indicator that that may be actually what's coming. Great question. All right, next up, this side, and we'll do you over there. The rest of you who are in line, meet us up at the top, out, just outside the auditorium, and we'll, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one chat. Hi, uh, Joseph Bornis. I'm a senior here at Norwich uh, Political Science. Uh, you touched earlier on uh, bridging the gap between uh, humans and AI. What do you think um, that gap is going to look like in the coming years where kids who have grown up with AI systems in the home, such as Alexa's, where they're asking them more questions than their own parents? Uh, what's that going to look like as those systems go from like an Alexa system and may develop into more of like a what is the fictional Jarvis system from Iron Man? Like, what, what is that gap gonna look like as those kids come into our position and then into the adult field in the military and civilian sectors? I, I think there is a real uh, kind of cultural chasm around that. Um, and being able to design in a way that allows a generation to rise into roles of responsibility, so those technologies are waiting is, is really important. One of the challenges is a lot of that tech, though, is going to come from the civilian world, or it's going to be, you know, on the leading edge in the civilian world first, not probably within the government space. So one of the challenges, I think, and this, especially when you get to like AI and data, uh, is incredibly thorny. But that may be part of what you end up seeing, right? Does you know you does if the army, for example, is going to have a tactical or even a kind of you know talk level assistant that is akin to something like a super Alexa, Jarvis, whatever? Are they going to have to? go to Amazon because Amazon is only, you know, the only company that has the data set that has the kind of natural language processing capabilities to, to do so. And the people. And the people. Uh, great point. So I think you're going you're gonna to see that gap persist um, because the demand signals, when they come from below, you know, typically aren't heard, right? But that's sort of incumbent on this, this you know, the generation coming up, you know, people like you, is to kind of communicate enough or, or to go make it happen yourselves. 
Uh, so you're not waiting for people who don't want to take a pilot out of a plane, for example. You know, that, that, again, is a healthy tension, but given the nature of the threat environment, given the nature of what countries like China are doing, you know, you can't fall in love with that tension and dichotomy too much. Uh, you have to actually really think about the kind of battlefield effect first. Thank you. All right, next, Sarah, and then we'll, we'll chat with us up top. Um, good morning, my name is Sean Bassey. I'm a senior in political science here at Norwich University. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in, your, in the discussion here, we talked a lot about bridging the gap, about negative connotations of AI, particularly stemming from earlier iterations of AI being terminators, killers, and so on and so forth. Uh, but as my peer had pointed out, uh, more younger generations are now seeing AI or the concept of AI as a more positive light, uh, particularly, you know, talking to Alexa for all your answer needs, your Siri on your phone, um, you know, the algorithm helping you pick out the, exactly what you need at that exact same time. What do you think is the risk of over optimizing or over, uh, what's the word? Um, over optimize, no. Optimize. Over optimistic? Over optimism of, about the integration of AI rather than the, the inherent like concern over it. So, you know, I grew up, my uh, Siri is my best friend, you know, he, she never did me wrong, so why don't we put as much military drones as possible into as much military technology as possible, and there's no way this could possibly go wrong. Um, what's your thoughts about that uh, opposite effect risk? It's a, I, I, you know, I, as someone who thinks about what could go wrong, like, all the time, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the biggest risks is that we lose our sense of agency with technology, and the nature of many of the most powerful AI systems in our everyday lives are effectively invisible. You know, the systems that recommend your next YouTube recommendation or keep spam out of your inbox. You know, those kinds of capabilities exist throughout our experience with like the network, the cloud, whatever you want to call it. And we no longer, especially in an app-driven world, understand computing in a way that is directed by us, right? We're kind of choosing from menus by, by choice. That's a different era of computing, you know, a kind of cultural level. Uh, so I worry about people losing the, the, the ability to understand that there is a choice that a certain capability, let's say it's super Siri, whether the, the risks that go with that, uh, that we can say, you know, we don't want to do that because we're just, that's how it works in this part of our lives that therefore in the defense realm it should, it should continue. I think having that sense of agency is incredibly important with technology. You know, in the specific sense, what are the concerns about being over-reliant on AI? You know, a good one is looking at the problems we have, you know, getting good data sets, you know, data that's accurate, like clean, data that's not biased. Uh, this is an incredibly challenging problem that no matter how much money some of the biggest technology companies are spending on their most profitable products, they still run headlong into this. And I don't think that we're going to be any different when we look into the defense realm. So I think being very aware and, and again, having that sense of agency about what we do or don't do with technology is an attitudinal or cultural thing that's so important. Uh, and I think actually is a competitive advantage, right? You know, it's a little bit of skepticism, but a lot more about, again, this notion of agency. That'll do it for us. We've run out of time. Thank you very much for coming and um, enjoy the rest of the chat.